All right. Oh, almost. Okay. Thank you. She'll have it up in a moment. And if there are any problems, I'll be at the back. So I can help be manual if needed. All right, we're going to get started. So I'm going to ask everyone to sit down. We don't have to sit later, though, right? Um, Sorry? I don't have to sit, though, really, do I? All right. So. Ascend has, um, as Anne has explained, three main strategies. And we heard, have been hearing a lot about some of them um, over the course of the past day and a half um, around solutions, practice, policy, and research solutions. This afternoon, we're going to talk more about policy. Um, but one of our other very important flagship investments is in leadership. And um, what the, the flagship program of that is the Aspen Institute Ascend Fellowship. And we have had the pleasure um, of yesterday of hearing from Reggie Bika, today from Henry Wilde, two of our very dynamic, creative, and inspiring fellows. Um, and what the fellowship does, it's an 18-month program that identifies um, really wonderful leaders who are sitting on big ideas and with the platforms and the creativity and the drive to put those ideas into action. Um, and so in this panel, we are very proud to welcome two of our incoming Ascend Fellows, and another one of those fellows, Kirsten Lodel, spoke yesterday, um, Sarah Watamura and Deepesh Navsaria. Um, and I'm definitely going to be keeping my eye on Anthony for future classes. <laughs> Um, but let me go ahead and introduce Anthony, and then he will introduce the panel and set the stage. So Anthony is a vice president at Ideas42, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, an organization that's doing some really phenomenally interesting work. Um, Anthony, prior to this, spent 10 years in the child welfare system, mostly in New England. Um, but he's also a practicing artist and has both an MFA in printmaking and an MPA from Harvard. Um, and uh, so he's got quite an uh, interesting background as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much. And, and I should also note, as many others have, that I'm a proud alumnus of Head Start myself. Um, so let's not uh, leave them out either. Uh, so from Head Start to Harvard, I guess that happens fairly frequently, right? Um, <laughs> So, uh, well, let me introduce uh, the two folks that you'll be hearing from today, um, so Sarah and Depeche. Uh, so I'm going to get this wrong, even though I told you I wouldn't, but you're <laughs> a developmental psychobiologist. You got it right. All right, fantastic. Um, and study uh, the effects of stress on kids and their bodies and their brains. Right. Um, so we'll be hearing uh, really interesting stuff from Sarah about recent research that she's completed uh, that has really, I think, interesting policy and practice implications. Um, and Depeche is, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, a Renaissance man might be the best way to describe you. So public health, physician, pediatrician, children's librarian, uh, aficionado of the bow tie, um, and just an excellent advocate for kids. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to let him talk about Reach Out and Read, which is a program uh, that he works on a lot. Um, but first, I want to do some stuff on PowerPoint. So if we could switch that over. Um, so one of the things that you may know about Ideas 42 is that we work in what we call the behavioral sciences, applied behavioral science, um, what others may call behavioral economics. It's really the confluence of kind of judgment and decision making, thinking with cognitive psych, social psych. And we think about how you apply that in the real world. Um, so for the last year, we've been thinking about uh, poverty and how you could use applied behavioral science in that context. And I want to stress the idea that context matters and that poverty itself is a context. So we heard from Marcella, for example, that you could think about poverty as a condition that requires some kind of standard treatment. Um, and we would tend to agree. We wouldn't think of it necessarily as a medical condition, but as a, a context in which people live. And if you'll allow me a little bit of a philosophical digression, I think that it merits you know, remembering Descartes and this kind of duality that Descartes posed. And I just want to attack it. Um, so we don't have minds and bodies. We don't have minds and brains, right? Like the mind is a thing that inheres in the brain. And the brain is a piece of the body which is kind of identified with the person living in a community with other people that's governed by norms and their interactions and relationships. And so all of that context really drives what people believe and how they act and how they behave. And if you live in a state of chronic scarcity, that's what we would kind of call poverty. So scarcity of anything, time, money, resources, et cetera. And that actually has really interesting effects on your kind of cognition. So if you've read, like, how many people have read Scarcity, the 
Eldar and Sendel's book. Okay, so these are guys that founded my organization, and so I'll give you some highlights since not many people have read it. Um, in essence, uh, if you prime people um, to be scarce on any of these things, then it can have these interesting cognitive effects, including um, your ability to focus. So you can kind of tunnel in on finishing a paper if you know that you've only got two days left to do it. Um, you can meet those deadlines. Uh, and so that's like a, you get a dividend from being scarce on time. But it has a flip side effect of taxing your bandwidth. So your brain is like a finite thing. Uh, and it has so much capacity to do whatever it is that you need it to do. Um, and when you're short on time or short on money or short on food, uh, that really captures your attention, uh, which makes it harder for you to do everything else in your life. So there's this famous study that they did in this mall in New Jersey uh, where they grabbed people out of the mall and they, got, they gave them some kind of prompts to think about. Uh, in one case, it was $150. In the other case, it was $1,500 that they had to you know, think about needing to fix their car with. Um, and after the fact, they kind of asked them some demo questions and uh, assorted them into two groups above or below median income. Um, but after prompting them to think about, OK, you had a car accident. Now you've got an expense. Uh, they then ran them through Raven's matrices, which is this uh, measurement of cognitive functioning. Uh, and in the condition of $150, everyone basically performed the same. So like within statistically significant range, they're essentially identical. But in the $1,500 condition, uh, there was now a, a gap between people that were below median and above median incomes uh, to the effect of like 13 IQ points, which is a whole standard deviation. So that could knock you from uh, ab above average intelligence to average or from average to deficient or however you want to frame that. So you know, just thinking about for like 15, 20 minutes, this hypothetical stressor of $1,500 can knock down your cognitive uh, performance. So what does that do if you have to think about that all day long, every day, when you're having to make choices about, well, do I pay the light bill or do I buy food? Do I have you know, diapers for the kid or fix the car? Uh, that trade-off thinking, that constant scarcity, is just a hallmark of poverty. And it has these knock-on effects, um, just like toxic stress will on your body. Uh, poverty, chronic scarcity, has these effects on your cognition and then all of the behaviors that manifest from it. So uh, OK, that's all really interesting, Anthony. So what? Um, let's see if we can advance this. So this is so what? So we've been talking to people throughout the country over the last year, doing research, primary and secondary both. And we'll be dropping this paper next week um, that'll tell you some of the so what. And I'll just walk you through uh, a couple of the things that I think are really interesting. So uh, in this two-gen principle stuff, we, we've got our own kind of three design principles for designing uh, human service programs in the context of, uh, of chronic scarcity. Uh, the first of which is to cut the costs, and the second of which is to create slack. And so these are kind of, they flow right from that scarcity thinking. So if you create contexts that are really costly for people, like making them fill out a ton of forms, some of which are redundant, and you know, coming back and forth to offices, um, that's really costly, not just in terms of your time, but also the money that you have to pay for gas or for car fare, um, and also just the expenditure of energy that you have to make to do it. Um, so if you can cut those costs, you can give people kind of a rebate on their bandwidth. Um, and if you can create Slack, which is kind of the opposite side of that coin, so if you can maybe give people some financial cushion, like what if they had a low-cost lender, if they needed to cover uh, some piece of billing for the month, uh, then that can help on the other side. And then the third design principle is about stuff that we've talked about a lot over the last few days, um, which kind of rests in the more social psych realm. So how do we do the thing to capture dignity for people? Um, and so we've heard a lot about how um, the context of poverty can be really humiliating. Um, so you have to kind of come as a supplicant to the welfare office and you know, kind of beg and plead uh, for some services. Um, and people treat you with suspicion. So you have to constantly you know, recertify yourself for eligibility. Um, like that's not only is it costly in terms of a variety of things, but it's also just humiliating. And most of us that have uh, resources like, wouldn't tolerate that level of scrutiny from a service provider. Um, and we call this human services, but attend very little to the customer service aspect of it, to ask the people, hey, how are we doing, and what could we do better? 
Um, and so we've heard a lot about you know, CQI, and, and part of doing that well is to solicit feedback from the folks that you're working with. So we've got uh, these like 15 things that we think you should do, but I, I'm gonna point to a few of them. So uh, the first of which is to reduce barriers to entry. Um, so we've heard a lot about this. How do you simplify forms? Apparently it's really unpopular uh, in the polling data, but uh, we think that simplification is really important. Um, the next one is to replace clips with slopes. Um, so this is really about how you can create slack. And I mean, you all know this stuff so that you, know, you get to a certain dollar threshold and all of a sudden you lose let's say your childcare or your food stamps or whatever. Um, and we think that you can do things to kind of even out that lumpy income uh, and that would be really good for people. Um, and then finally, treating families as experts. So how do you um, let people know that they're the experts on their lives and their needs um, and demonstrate that stuff to them? So um, that's that in a nutshell. Uh, follow us at Ideas42 on Twitter or email me or come harangue me and I'll make sure you get a copy of the white paper when it comes out next week. Um, but I want to point out some of the behavioral insights that I think um, we'll be hearing from you two about. Uh, the first of which is mental models. So if any of you guys read this World Bank report that came out on anybody? No? Um, so mental models are this thing, this way that we understand the world. You can think of it as like a, a, a construct. And so you kind of behave in accordance with your beliefs. So if I told you, hey, you all know that you can fly, right? Like this is just something that we can do. Uh, so let's go to the roof and take a fly. You'd be like, you're an idiot, Anthony. You, know, you can't fly. Your mental model of the world um, does not include flying. So there's similar things true about people, say, living in poverty. So you know, I grew up in the projects in, in Eastie and in South Boston. Um, and my mental model of folks like me didn't include, say, going to the Ivy Leagues. Uh, so that's restricting your behavior when you have a model of the world that doesn't include certain things. Um, and I think that there's interesting mental models that you all will touch on in terms of what can I prescribe as a physician, um, not just medication, um, but also reading. Um, and I think that that's really interesting stuff from a behavioral perspective that you might be able to also do with parents. So uh, do you have a mental model of the world as adults being non-plastic in their brains? Um, well, surprise, we've got new information for you. Um, the other thing is reset moments. So this is something that we try to leverage a lot in helping people do more of what they want and less of what they don't. Uh, inertia is a thing in human behavior, and so people have habits. And even if you have an intention, and a plan and a desire to start doing something new or stop doing something old, it can be really hard to execute on those desires and intentions. But when you have a kid or when you get a new physician or when a new year rolls around and you make uh, some kind of resolution, these reset moments can help uh, jumpstart uh, some kind of new path. Uh, and I think that there's, that's kind of replete in both of what you'll talk about. Um, and then finally, leveraging identity is something that I think is really interesting. And so how do you help parents reimagine what parenting is? Um, can they be their child's first educator? Is this even a thing that you've thought about? Um, and how do you as a service provider maybe even leverage the identities that you see in parents to think of them in a different way? Um, so uh, that's it for me. Um, I'll now kind of turn it over to my panelists, and I think, Sarah, you're going first. Um, so here's your clicker. Thank you. I, I can't possibly sit, so that was really painful for me for that amount of time. Um, so I'm sorry, but I have to move. Um, <clears throat> so I think, let's see what happened. Oh. Getting this Okay. We're just looking at us, which is okay. <laughs> okay, can you back up? Does it back up? There we go. Good? Does it go forward? Excellent. OK. All right. Um, so I, uh, let's see, it would, must have been just over, a, just under a year ago, um, was sitting around a table in Aspen with many of these lovely folks who are here. And we were talking about this whole idea of investing in parents and investing in kids. and. Um, I got confused. I, I literally just got confused and was saying, okay, so sorry, I'm just confused. Are we investing in parents as people because we care about them as people? Or are we investing in them as, as agents of change? Um, because all of the evidence that you're using is talking about how the first few years of life is so important and all this stuff is happening in the brain, it's changing and it's amazing. I'm like, that story actually sounds like you shouldn't invest in parents as people because it sounds like your brain is done after early childhood, right? 
So I just raised my hand and said, what are we doing? And they all looked at me and said, well, no, no, well we're going to do all of it, because of course that's, that's how they answer questions, right? Like, yeah, no, no, we're totally, we're totally doing all of it. Um, and I said, well, you know, there, there is some really good evidence, actually, that investing in parents as people makes sense. So I can you know, look into that and try to pull some of that together for you guys. And here we are. We've written a paper on it. Um, and we are ready to, I guess it's officially unreleased right now. Da, da, da. Um, uh, and we have called it Two Open Windows, um, Infant and Parent Neurobiologic Change. And I am going to give you a really um, intense biology lesson. Every, anybody afraid of science? I love people who are afraid of science. A little bit? OK. I, I got you. We're totally going to do this together. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick walk through what's happening in kids' brains, which should be familiar territory, but a few new, hopefully, new facts for you. and then. Um, what we think is going on when parents make the transition to becoming parents, um, massive uh, structural and functional reorganization in their, in their brains, and how we might be able to therefore leverage that change as exactly what Anthony was referring to. So a, what did you call it? A reset. A yes. reset. Um, I think that's literally what it is. I think there are a number of them across adulthood. Adolescence is the next big one. But then I think there are a number of points, and we will increasingly hear about that as the, as the research on um, brain science continues. So uh, this is the basic framework. That's my daughter. Um, and she is in her first and most important sensitive period. Um, and largely, I and my partner make up her social, emotional, and educational environment. Because she's under two, she doesn't go to preschool. So you know, we're basically it. Okay. And so then you could treat me as the agent of change. You could invest in me as someone um, who can do things for her. You could give me parenting programs. You could. Um, teach me how to do things. You could, I hope, increase my self-efficacy, because I think that's a key. So any parenting program that turns up and makes people think they don't know how to do the job that they're the only person on earth who can do is a waste of time and is a huge disservice. Um, and I am a changing agent, right? I got on a plane this morning and flew here. I'm doing this, and I'm doing a million things like every parent is. And the more stress they're under, the more things they're doing, right? So I'm also a person under change. And this all looks you know, pretty lovely. We've, we're, we're doing all right. We're almost to two. But <clears throat> that's where we started. Okay, She was pissed when she got here. Look at her face. <laughs> I mean, look at that face. <laughs> you know? And then look at me there at three months. OK? I'm, <laughs> um, you know, it took us a while to get to, get to this point. I mean, <laughs> she, she didn't sleep for over a year. And most of the folks that I met, the first time I met you guys, she still wasn't sleeping. Um, you know, she, she was, she's an awesome kid. And she, <laughs> she, she has her own ideas about everything. She just told me the other day while crying. Weather is not reasonable. <laughs> OK, well, at least you know yourself, right? Um, so uh, so this, is, this is what we're talking about at the beginning. OK, you've got this, this young, this brand new, difficult little creature who doesn't know how to do anything, has no idea what's going on, and has to learn absolutely everything. And this parent who doesn't know anything either. OK, as much as I could not have more relevant education, it did not matter at 4 in the morning. Okay? doesn't matter. So you have to, you have to you know, work with this reality. Um, <clears throat> OK, so here's the, I know, isn't that the most adorable infant ever? Um, I don't know that child, unfortunately. Um, OK, so we're, I'm going to give you the brief overview of why we all invest in children. Um, and and it really, I think, comes down to a few things that, that have been very well validated. And the reason I want to go over this is because I think this is territory that has worked. This has worked. Right? It's worked politically. It's worked in, in people's um, behaviors and their understanding. You can take somebody off the street, and they know this stuff, at least at a certain level. So this has been effective. And I want to then think about how we can make the information about parents changing brains as effective. So I think the pieces that have been effective is, OK, we understand early life is the first and likely most, insensitive, most uh, important sensitive period. And I'll tell you what, what that looks like. Um, we know that early adversity is linked to lifelong physical and mental health concerns. So we have some very good data on that and lots of additional information coming in. We have good return on investment data, right? So we have information about what happens when you invest early. Um, although if you look carefully at that data, a lot of the really good data does rely on change in parents. Um, and because it's intuitive. So this might be the place where we have to struggle a little bit. It's intuitive to want to do something for that baby, right? Why is it intuitive to want to do something for that baby? 
because your brain knows what to do about babies. So can we do something to help people with that piece? Can we do something to help organize ourselves, our changing brains, in the face of a young, vulnerable thing? So that's, that's and I'm very open to people's um, input on all of those issues. OK, so a sensitive period is simply a period in life where you are particularly open to experience. That's actually literally what it means. So it's both inherently both an opportunity and a vulnerability. The two things go hand in hand. Um, it's a vulnerability for negative inputs, which is what we often think about. But it's also a vulnerability for the lack of positive inputs. OK, so it's a time when you need a lot coming in to get things sorted out correctly. So all three of those pieces are really important. Um, the basics of how uh, a brain is built, you have neurons. So those are your brain cells, the ones we thought all of them were born early and then you don't get anymore. Turns out that's not true. But you do get most of them pretty early. Um, and then the rest of the story is that those neurons have to communicate with each other. That's how everything happens in your brain. That's what we're looking at when you're looking at pretty pictures of lit up brains on Time Magazine. That's what you're looking at, the lit up part, is the, the cells communicating with each other. <clears throat> so in order to communicate with each other, they have to connect to the right cell at the right time, um, and they have to do that quickly. So those pieces, trying to understand how those pieces get built, is a lot of, um, is a lot of what has been leveraged very effectively. So lots and lots of neurons getting built, um, coming to, for example, uh, by seven weeks gestation, so that's five weeks post-conception, we already have nerve cells trying to connect to each other, making those primitive nerve, nerve paths. Over 100,000 nerve cells being born per minute in the prenatal period. So no wonder folks are tired and hungry. Um, <clears throat> and at birth, the baby will have 100 billion nerve cells. So they're coming with a lot of machinery. But it's very basic machinery. And the big job is getting all the right connections to the right place. So um, the example that happened to me, and so maybe you can relate. I don't know. Who has a smartphone? Everybody? OK. I had a smartphone, and then I got a new one, and all of a sudden, there were all of these people in it I didn't know. So it synced itself up with something else. I don't know how it did that. All of a sudden, all of these people in my contacts, OK? So I just want to call Anne, right? I need her right now. I'm locked out of the building. And there are seven Anne's in my list, OK? So you have this good feature called favorites, right, where you can connect to the people you can enter in. Your, you know, top people that you want to connect to really quickly. When you have an emergency, you've got to get to those people right away. That's part of what the brain is doing. It's making those favorites. It's making those connections to things that it needs to get to very quickly, very efficiently. And then it's going to keep all those other contacts in there of things that might happen on occasion. That's fine. And then the things that never, ever happen, we're going to defriend those. OK? So that's part of what is going to happen in this kid's early brain. So that's all great. And you can think about baby Mozart or all this you know, other kinds of nonsense that people get into doing. Um, but they, you know, because we, the, the flip side, of course, is that all, the, you know, all of us start overdoing it. Um, but you know, you're, you're building up all of, those, um, all of those basic pieces. So just to give you an example that's not usually talked about, um, there's two types of input the brain needs. It needs the type that every single human needs. Okay? Every single person in our species needs to see light in order to form eyes that can see. Okay? If you don't have light exposure, your eyes will not wire up. Basic fact. Okay? So it turns out that's also true for social emotional stuff, which makes sense. But we never talk about that. Okay? We think about the brain very cognitively, very um, you know, in terms of motor function, those kinds of things. So in order to be able, ultimately, to recognize facial emotions, to, to therefore engage in relationships using facial information, you have to see faces very early. And you have to see them right up close to you where you can actually see them, right? Because when you're first born, you remember back to my grouchy little newborn, you can't see very far. In fact, how far can they see? They can see the distance from your face to where they would be if you were holding them and nursing them. That's literally the distance that they can see. And they need a face right there. Okay? So they can't have a bottle being held like this, or they can't process a face. Okay, Then there's the, the experience dependent piece. This is what makes all of us unique. So you can speak whatever language is spoken in your community, um, learn all the different kinds of things. And facial expressions are no different. So facial expressions are used differently in different cultures, different times and places. So the types of facial expressions that infants see help them form their understanding of facial expressions. 
which ones to make, how finely to be able to tell different kinds of facial expressions apart. So if a baby has a depressed parent and they're only seeing very flat facial expressions, they're not as able to differentiate facial expressions later, okay? Because they haven't gotten all that input that they needed. And another example is if they see a lot of angry faces, they become very quick and very fast at processing angry adult faces because angry adult faces are a good cue. Um, but what about all the other richness and variety? So this is a good example of what happens when kids are given only certain kinds of information um, when they're trying to, trying to build up this brain. And they are doing it very, very quickly. Um, so this, um, this is just an example that uh, is often used. So if you wanted to learn a new word, I don't know if there are any new words. Did you say any new words? Well, I, I could mix them up. What <laughs> yeah. about uh, hermeneutics? There we go. So you want to learn that. Okay, you're not going to make it to the elevator. Uh, I mean, you're literally not. You're not. You will get out to the elevator and I'll say, what was that word? Now you're going to rehearse it, so you will. But, um, <laughs> you know, most of us, even if we thought it was the best, coolest word and, you know, you, just, you came across it, you're not going to learn it because your brain is not prepared for learning new words right now. So if you want to learn it, you have to give yourself 10 exposures. So go ahead and cut yourself a break for the times you haven't been able to learn those new words in your little micro professions, right? Um, but, and then if you really have to learn a new word, give it the 10 exposures it's going to take, okay? So my little daughter, though, is at a time in her life where she can learn a word with a single exposure. Um, in the right social context, with the right information, not from the television, not from radio, not from a distracted, I'm not paying attention to what you're looking at parent, but from a very specific um, type of social input that we all know how to do with pitch modulated voice. Um, pointing at the right object that the child has identified they're interested in, single exposure. So it's just a different time. It's a different time. It's a time when they're building their language capacity. It's a time when they're learning about facial expressions. Well, it turns out that when you're becoming a new parent, that's a time when your brain is doing other kinds of things. And there are going to be lots of times in life where your brain has specific tasks at hand. Um, we included this toxic stress framework in our paper because Lori wanted me to. Um, and because it's, I think, a little bit helpful for thinking about this transition between, okay, so then why do we think about parents as our target agents of change? So this is kind of the next piece. So I know I didn't have to convince you that investing in kids is a good idea, but that's the basic set of argument that's made, right, for why we should do it. Okay. Um, so in the toxic stress framework, um, which was offered by pediatrician Jack Shonkoff and colleagues, um, what they wanted to do is take 40 years of research and condense it into something anybody could understand, translate it, you know, explain it to a policymaker while you're running across the green or whatever they're doing, um, and you know, get, it, get it explained really, really quickly. And so basically the idea here is it's not that certain things are toxic, certain events that happen. It's that the context, back to what Anthony was saying, the context is what makes a negative event toxic. Okay, so something bad has happened. And the adults in your life, if you're a child, are unable to buffer you from that. There's some reason why the adults can't buffer you from it. Okay, so imagine somebody important in the family dies. This is a very negative event. It's going to be a negative event for anyone. If it also then removes the primary source of income and puts the other adult or adults into a um, you know, depressed state, that is now a toxic event for that child because they don't have an adult to buffer them from that experience. Is it going to take a toll and have a cost regardless? Sure. But what makes it toxic is that lack of supportive protection. Um, and they've come to that conclusion by reviewing a lot of animal literature, um, lots of different kinds of work. And so the focus here then, if the difference between what's tolerable and what's toxic is that key adult, then investing in the key adult makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, so this is just a little bit of evidence um, for, why, for how um, uh, one of the things I really like about the toxic stress framework is that they focus on biologic mechanisms. So how do, of course I like that, right? Um, they they want to know how do these experiences and these contexts make you sick? How do they make you not achieve it as much as you should? Um, so trying to unravel some of that. If you take a look at this just basic thing, um, so parents were asked about how stressed they were while they were pregnant. I hope there's nobody pregnant in here. This always makes people nervous. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we got one? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry. Do some meditating. Um, so, so parents reported how stressed they were during pregnancy. And we took their, um, this is a, a colleague of mine. I didn't do this myself. Um, uh, took their stress hormone levels multiple times during pregnancy. OK? So we have an indication of how stressed the parent, the, the mother is. Right after birth, you take that grouchy newborn daughter of mine, and you stick her in the heel 
and do a heel stick blood draw, medically necessary, important procedure. They don't like it, they scream. Um, and most infants show a stress response to that event. Perfectly normal, they've been insulted, that's fine. Um, so, but if you separate out kids according to how much mom's stress hormones they've already experienced before birth, the ones who had more stress exposure before birth did not recover from that insult in the time while we were watching. They kept their stress hormone profiles up, okay? Because they have learned, right, that when bad things happen, you should probably be a little vigilant. Um, that's likely the case. Now, of course, there are, you know, connections between parents and children that, that have more to do than uh, just experience. Um, take those same kids, look at them when they're six to eight years old, and they are more fearful um, and more uh, vigilant in new situations. The same piece of information, right? They're, they're still watching, okay, when things are negative, you know, what do I do? Um, this is not necessarily a bad trait. If you live in a difficult environment, being wary of danger and vigilant for danger is not a, a, not a bad trait. It's a smart thing to do. Um, but it does take resources, just like what Anthony was talking about, about this scarcity, this cost. And you take those same kids and they have larger right amygdala volumes. And the right, your right amygdala is just the part of your brain when spring comes and somebody gets the hose out and you didn't do it, and you come around the corner and you for a hot second think it's a snake. It's the part of your brain where you go, ah, before you would have time to go, that's not a snake. Because in reality, if it was a snake, that microsecond would cost you your life. Okay, so that's what your amygdala does for you, among other things. I like the simplification. <laughs> um, all right, so, and then this is just another piece of information. So um, this is a great study out of Oregon I really like. Um, what they did is they had babies, they asked parents how much fighting goes on at home. So people were probably over-reporting that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just check in if you're listening. Uh, so, so people probably under-reporting that a little bit. A lot of fighting sometimes in the first few months. Um, and they had babies, uh, put them in a, a brain scanner. And in order to scan babies, at least the current way that we do it, is we put them in a sleep. Um, so they go into the scanner asleep. And all they did was they were played audio recordings of angry or neutral adult voices. Okay, the babies whose parents reported more fighting at home had more responsive brains while they were asleep to angry voices. Okay, so, and it's, it's a pretty strong association, um, and it's in the appropriate areas. So while they're asleep, they're tracking their environment for danger. Okay, so this is just trying to build up our understanding of how does your experience get into your body, get into your brain, and change your priorities. It makes your priorities more focused on the short term, on survival, and it makes it harder to do things like you know, plan for you know, being a healthy, healthy into retirement. Um, if you look at, I'm not going to talk a lot about the return on investment stuff, but if you look at the data, a lot of it comes down to, so this is from the Perry Preschool Project, most of the recovery of income is from reduction in crime, which is highly tied to mental health. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. And if you look at uh, Heckman's stuff and on his website, it's very clear that the, the focus is on providing resources to children and their families. So it's not a, a one generation approach. All right, and it's fun to invest in kids in there. You know, you feel, they feel like a clean slate, right? We like that idea. Um, so that's, that's I'm, I'm not trying to detract from that. I'm all for investing in kids. Um, so then the next piece is investing in parents as agents of change. So we, we target programs that parents um, show up often at their house or have them come take a class where we teach them parenting skills um, or give them different kinds of um, strategies. Um, some of that work that's gone on for a long time has not been super effective. Um, and I think a just skills-based approach actually probably doesn't make a ton of sense. Because is it really that they don't know what to do? Is that really the core issue? Um, or is it a scarcity issue? Um, so uh, a, sort of the new generation of programs tend to focus more on um, parents as the first and most important environments for their children and how to support that uh, relationship piece. Um, and um, there's lots and lots of parenting programs, lots and lots of good parenting programs. Um, home visitation is now a national priority um, for some demographics. And <clears throat> many prevention and intervention programs now include a video coaching uh, methodology. That's very common. And so basically what that looks like is you videotape the parent and the child together in a free play scenario. And then you give them very targeted feedback. Um, Programs differ. The one that we use is completely strengths-based. Um, like I said, we're there for a relatively short time. So my view is that I'm there to show you that you already know how to do this job. 
and that this is your top priority. And why is it your top priority? Because you're not going to get this time back. So we focus very, look at how you're doing this. When you do that, and you look at how you're looking at your baby right now. When you do that, he's building his brain. He's learning the word for truck. He's learning that you love him and you care about him. You know, we, get, we literally build, give them all those pieces of information. And then talk about, okay, what's going on in your environment and how can we make it more possible for you to do this more often? Rather than videotaping people and saying, you're not doing something right here, um, which is another approach that is sometimes used. Um, it, uh, broad-based prevention programs like um, Depeche is going to talk about, like Reach Out and Read, actually have. Uh, there's, the VIP program is a component of some aspects of Reach Out and Read, which is a, includes a video coaching piece. So it can be used um, as an add-on to Head Start or Reach Out and Read or other programs that have broadband services for everyone and then sort of more targeted support for some families. OK, is, so is early life the only important sensitive period? We think absolutely not. We think adolescence is likely the next one. And then the next big one is parenting. Um, and that's what the paper is mostly about. So who's a parent? OK, so do you think you're changed? <laughs> yes? Anybody think that parenting did not change you? No, OK. All right, so it's like everything with brain science. It's like we do something like this, and everybody goes, uh-huh. That was really expensive and took a long time. I already knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, if I don't do it, if we don't do it, we can't get more money for anything. So it's kind of a funny, it's kind of a funny game. OK. So, but this is, this is actually really cool data because it's just, it, what's amazing to me is the extent of the reorganization that's happening in a new parent's brain. Um, okay, so we know that parents, especially first time parents reporting high levels of anxiety and concern over their infant's well being. This is a good thing. It helps them take care of that infant and not forget to pick it up or um, feed it or care for it. Um, and even in what could be called low risk families, this anxiety and concern is often coupled with financial demands. Most people take some financial demands when they have a new, a new child. Sleep deprivation is almost universal, at least in the first month, and changes in relationships with parents, between parents. So if anybody thinks that your relationship's gonna be the same after you have a kid, you know, that's nuts. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, you know, it's, it, there's all these myths that go around, and it's interesting. Okay, so difficulty, um, Managing the stress of the transition to parenting, so when people report above and beyond the average amount that they're really struggling with this stress of this transition, that's a risk for harsh parenting. Harsh parenting is a global term that includes abuse and neglect, but can also just be a more punitive uh, parenting approach. Um, risk for relationship difficulties with their own uh, co-parent, and risk for serious postpartum mood disorder. So helping people manage this stress during this transition is a really important priority. OK, so um, this work was originally done in animals, like most um, neurobiologic work. And it was done with um, biparental species and um, non-biparental species. So biparental species are like prairie bulls. Um, and basically, that work led to some really interesting ideas about how much the brain might be changing in preparation for parenting and in the transition to parenting. So um, the human work, and I co-authored this paper with my colleague Pil Young Kim, and most of the human work I'm talking about is hers or other people that she works with, so I didn't actually scan any moms. Um, and in that work, um, what we see are massive structural changes and important functional changes in three key areas. So I'm going to tell you what types of changes happen in the brain when people become parents, and I bet you will see that they make a lot of sense to those of you who have been through that transition. So changes in the reward circuit, in the emotion regulation circuit, and in the social information processing circuit. So <clears throat> you may not know this about rats, but they love cocaine. Um, <laughs> this is actually not true of all humans. So, but it, is, it does appear to be true, at least of the rat, <laughs> of the rat species that are typically uh, studied. They pretty much universally love cocaine. So they will hit the lever to get cocaine all day long. They will not eat. They will not have sex. They will not sleep. They will not do other things. They will just hit the cocaine lever, OK? When they become new parents, for the first week, now their lives are really short, so the first week is a long time. For the first week, they will press the lever to hear their pup cry and not the cocaine lever for one week, new moms, OK? So they are choosing to listen to the pup cry over the cocaine that they otherwise choose over every other thing, OK? So it's a massive reorganization of priorities. It's a massive reorganization of priorities that's necessary for our survival. So it's actually not surprising that everything becomes about keeping that baby alive, right? 
but that's what's happening. Um, there's a lot of work trying to figure out how that happens. There's hormones that are involved, like oxytocin. Um, dopamine sensitizes the circuit to infant-related cues, and there's a lot of work being under, uh, done to understand how it happens. So new mothers and fathers during the first few months postpartum ex exhibit structural growth in this circuit. So that part of the brain literally gets bigger. Um, and the amount of growth that we see is connected to how much they describe their child with positive feelings, like beautiful, perfect. Um, so so the, you know, it's not just that the brain is getting bigger, but the bigger brain is connected to those feelings. Um, and more functional brain activity happens when they look at their own versus another infant. Okay, so we all thought that one baby was cute, but compared to your own baby, you know, and none of them are really cute when they're first born, but you really think they are. You really, really do. You think it's not going to happen to you, but. Um, OK, and then the social information circuit is an interesting one. So this is a part of the brain that's involved in empathy and self-monitoring and reflection. And it's, uh, it's different in people who have disorders like autism. So it's part of how we recognize each other's complicated social skills, uh, social, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, signals, social signals. OK, so it's how you process social signals and make sense of them. So when you have this new baby, remember back to my cranky little newborn, OK? You're trying to figure out what those signals mean. Now, parents will do crazy things during that first stage, right? They only sleep when I lean against the dryer and, you know, do this jiggle and play Billy Joel. Like, that's what works. Um, you know, that's not really what works, but they're trying so hard to detect the signal and give the right thing, right? They're using so much effort on that one thing. And the signal, frankly, is just unreliable for the first few months. It just is. OK, so you're not going to actually figure it out, but keep trying. You know, it's good. <laughs> You'll get there eventually. And then when you go through that period of time where actually nobody else can really take care of your kid that well, because you're the only person who can read those signals. So how did you do that? You tuned your brain really, really carefully to, to read those signals and be the person who can respond to them. So changes in this circuit make a lot of sense. Um, so new mothers and fathers exhibit neuroplasticity in this circuit, including structural increases and heightened response to infant cries and images of their own infant, OK? Um, so we think that this helps them understand those cues and, and come to behave appropriately in interactions with their infant. All right, emotion regulation. Parenting, turns out, involves a lot of emotion regulation. <laughs> um, there's a lot of delay of your own needs and, and everything, right, in order to, to care for this creature who is also presenting a fair number of negative stimuli, right? Crying, waking you up in the middle of the night, things that are otherwise not, you know, things you'd respond to positively. Okay, so you have to detect the signal that you have to feel, like anxious enough to get out of bed at 4 in the morning and not just ignore it, right? You gotta, you gotta feel it, but then you have to regulate it, right? You can't get so overwhelmed that you're like, oh my god, the baby's crying, oh my god! What are we going to do? Right? You can't do that. That's not going to work. Okay? So, okay. so you have to do um, both pieces. Okay? Um, so basically, we want to look for amygdala activation and prefrontal regulation. So we're looking for those two pieces together. Um, and we do see that. Um, so animal and human mothers both exhibit reduced reactivity to stressors directed at themselves. So parents are actually less responsive to stressors just uh, behaviorally and physiologically that directed at themselves as compared to their baby. Um, and we see structural growth in these circuits and functional activity. Um, <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to skip that part. OK, so what happens when parents are coming to parenting with some vulnerability? OK, does this work the same for everyone? Does your parenting, your own history of what kind of parenting you receive matters? It turns out it looks like it does. OK, so we don't all come to this job with the, with the same brain, prepared in the same way. Um, postpartum vulnerabilities are important, and we know that uh, depression is actually very, very common. It's very common in both mothers and fathers, and that's usually not discussed. Um, so 60 to 80 percent of new mothers report some postpartum blues, um, and up to 25 percent of all new mothers and fathers report postpartum depression. Um, and we know that postpartum depression is one of the most consistently linked um, problems to, ch to child outcomes. So when, in, when parents are stressed, uh, depressed, or substance abusers, we see much less neural activation in these circuits that we were just talking about. Um, it's also true when you look at parents who have PTSD, so a history of trauma. And it is also true when you look at parents who have 
uh, received less sensitive caregiving themselves. So they've not sort of built up a preparatory system for this. Um, one possible mechanism is an epigenetic mechanism. Um, epigenetics are, the, that's the information that tells your uh, DNA which genes to activate and inactivate at different times across the lifespan. And you can actually inherit your epigenetic information across at least a few generations, which is kind of crazy, but makes sense. Like if there was a famine right now and bad things happen, it might be useful to remember that not just one generation, but two generations down the line. So we are able to encode information about our environment, and some of the best models of that is our stress models. So stressing animals, you can see an effect two to three generations later on the way they express their genes. Okay, so not the genes themselves, but which ones they turn on and when. Um, so that's one possible uh, mechanism being explored. So if you take here, these are moms high versus low in the parenting they received. So they're reporting to you what kind of parenting they received. And you have them listen to a baby cry or a control noise. And parents who listened, uh, who reported having better caregiving themselves are more responsive to infant cries in general. Okay, so just any baby. If you then take that information and look at their own infant, um, those who have more responsive brains to their own infant cry are rated by third parties as more sensitive caregivers. And that's a really strong association for any kind of research, but especially behavioral. Um, so really strong connection between how much your brain responds to your baby's crying and how sensitive you're rated as a parent. Okay, so it does really seem to matter. Um, all right, I don't know that we have time for all that because Lori's waving numbers at me. Um, <laughs> but I think that the basic take home, a lot of what this research has done for me is just make me more empathic toward how difficult this job is, how much is required to do it, how that's true of everyone, um, and how there really is just no such thing as leveling a playing field. I can take away your current stressful circumstances, but I can't change that you live through them, right? And I'm not sure I should want to, because we're all the product of all of the things that have happened to us um, across time and you know, historically and across um, you know, many, many different factors. And trying to, it's, I had this slide up here because you know, we used to, we had this thing about being colorblind and how um, we all know how ridiculous that turned out as an idea, right? Oh yes, we'll just be colorblind. Um, this is kind of the same thing. Why does it make sense to try to erase or be unresponsive to differences and in inequities? They have happened, they are part of our history, they're embedded in our brains and bodies, and they are who we are. So why can't we let individuals then define their current important pieces and components and what they're gonna do about them? Why can't that all be part of what we recognize about our own histories? You know, we, we say, we talk about them as if they can be erased. And I think it's pretty clear that they can't be erased. They can be handled, they can be taken into account, but I don't think erasing them makes any sense. Um, okay. We had a few recommendations. You don't do them? Yeah, I'm fine with that. You can look at the recommendations, they're in the, they're in the paper. All right. So I'm sure that everyone has um, innumerable questions for Sarah, uh, who did a wonderful job teaching us biology um, as a kind of science illiterate. Um, so, but why don't we move yeah. it over to Dipesh. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, it's always, it's always hard to follow Sarah. This is the second time I've had to follow her and she does such a great <laughs> job. Um, so next time we'll have to work it out, so I go first, okay, yeah. <laughs> so. Make me suffer. So um, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm a, most, of my, most of my work is as a primary care pediatrician. I work in a community health center in South Madison. So I, I like to joke that you know, we talk about evidence-based medicine. Well, my job is to do reality-based medicine, um, which is, you know, again, to, I work with so many families who uh, uh, really face so many of these issues that we're, we're talking about out there. So we're going to do a few things on our short voyage. We'll talk a bit about the intersection of the early brain. You've heard so much just now about all that. So some of this I'll move through quickly because you've heard it already. But where pediatrics, where primary care pediatrics really meets that, we'll talk a bit about the reality of reading and then about the Reach Out and Read program itself. The American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a national organization for pediatricians, um, has strategic priorities that they release every year. This is from a few years ago, but you can see in the key um, priorities for the academy, this concept of early brain and child development was one of those key uh, areas. And I'm very proud to have served on the national leadership group for, the, uh, for early brain and child development. This is now being integrated into um, 
hopefully every aspect of the academy over time. Um, there, this is our motto. You need to have something that fits nicely on a coffee mug or something, although I never saw the coffee mugs. Um, building brains, forging futures. But the subhead is really what's so important. It's all about nurturing relationships. That relationships piece is really what we find so key. Um, there's an urgency to this, and I, I know you all know this, that you know, we can't wait for the next generation of kids, more research, et cetera. We need to be moving faster on this. But there's also this idea, this essential role of us. And by us, I mean all of those of us who, who touch the lives of children in some way, shape, or form. We see what happens. We see what happens when policies and programs fail. So we need to make sure that we speak up and that we do what we can as well out there. So these are my colleagues on the EBCD group. I learned a lot from them. Hopefully they learned something from me um, in the meantime. But there's uh, so many great people thinking about this in the world of pediatrics. Uh, David Willis is our past chair um, only because he uh, moved on to head the McWee program at, at the Fed. So he's doing some great work there. So some of you may be familiar with the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, which of course involved Jack Shankoff and others. And they came out with these big principles about EBCD. And I want to walk through them very quickly because I think they are so important to understanding the work that the Academy has done that we really use as foundational. And I, and I like these because they take science, they take some of the things you've heard about, and they say, great, now how do we apply this? How do we use this in the real world out there? And you know, they said some really important things. And people are often shocked when I present some of these things because they, they say, wow, that makes sense, but the fact that you have to say it is really something else. That child development is a foundation for community and economic development. You know, we, we don't think of kids as future potential economic units, right? But, but, but they are. You know, these are your future citizens. In Wisconsin, we recently had a referendum where we protected our highway trust fund from being raided because we felt our infrastructure, transportation infrastructure needed to be protected and couldn't be used by the state government for other things. And my question was, so where's our early brain infrastructure fund? You know, when, where, where, why aren't we protecting that as well? No one answered me on that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Number two, brains are built over time. You've heard so much about these various periods in which there's uh, differential sensibility, uh, sensitivity to um, uh, outside influences and so on. We need to recognize and realize that over time. There's two things that shape the developing brain, and I like to think of it as being like a campfire, right? You need the wood and you need that spark in order to, to get that campfire going. Well, it's your genes and it's your experience. Those two things literally shape the architecture of the developing brain, as you just heard. And if you had to pick out an active ingredient, what is it that makes that difference? It is the serve and return, like in tennis, that back and forth nature of engagement and relationships with people talking. And that's what drives development moving forward. Brain architecture and abilities are built from the bottom up. When people ask you know, naive questions like, why are we spending money on kids playing with blocks? Well, it's because, as T. Barry Breslin said, play is the work of infancy. This is their job. It's their job to develop these skills so they can do more and do later and all these things out there. You heard about toxic stress. These high levels, these, these levels of prolonged stress exposure of cortisol and other hormones staying up there have an effect on that young developing brain and causes the damage. We know that early adversity has so, much, uh, so many effects on children throughout their lives over time. So if you think about it, oops, I see this a lot in my, in my clinic. You have the kid who's impulsive, right? I get, they get come in, uh, sent in by the school. They say, oh, they can't plan ahead. Oh, you know what? They're anxious. Uh, this kid can't delay gratification. Their mood's all over the place. Their memory's really crummy. And this is what's often sent to me. Please evaluate this child for ADHD or something like that. And the problem is that they don't tend to respond really well to the medications we usually use for ADHD. There's some kids that do, but a lot of them don't. And when I start going back through their histories, I discover that when their mom was pregnant, they experienced all sorts of adverse events. This child was exposed to violence, you know, that they saw violence unfolding in front of them repeatedly. Um, their parents, uh, there was all sorts of household dysfunction or substance abuse or so on. And what I start asking myself is that these brain changes, these hormone changes, all these neurobiological things you heard about, that is this really ADHD or is what we're talking about the brain effects of adversity? We just have this really big label that probably has so many little subparts to put on it. As many of you know, we screen kids for lead because lead is neurotoxic and we spend a lot of time and effort making sure that kids aren't being exposed to lead. Well, we, uh, I think we need to also realign our thinking and realize that the effects of poverty are also neurotoxic and we need to be screening for that 
and looking for it and trying to mitigate it wherever possible that we've put a lot of effort into lead, we should be putting that effort into the effects of poverty as well. Because the last point from that report was that the right conditions for early childhood development is more effective and less costly than trying to address these problems later on. So these are the types of messages that the academy is trying to get to the average practicing pediatrician, family doc, whoever, who's out there on the front line seeing kids so that they understand that this has to be part of what we ask because traditionally it hasn't been. But more and more people are starting to ask those questions over time. And that the brave new world of pediatrics, yes, I still do ear infections and runny noses and all those sorts of things and immunizations, et cetera. But my job in a sense is this notion of developmental assurance. How do I help make sure that the kid has not just a healthy body but a healthy mind and a healthy brain um, really when, for when they reach adulthood, whatever point you decide adulthood starts. And as Frederick Douglass said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Long before we knew what cortisol was and had MRI scanners and all these different things, he understood this principle. So I always make sure to throw that in there. So given all that, what can we do about it? I will offer you the solution. Well, no, not really. I'll offer you principles of solutions because as we all know, there isn't just one magic solution, one magic bullet that we can use that'll fix everything that's out there. So, we need solutions that will build the capabilities of parents. And, and you've heard so much about that, that parent who doesn't know how to do effective face-to-face -face interaction because it hasn't been modeled in their environment, we can certainly model that and do some quick training and teaching and so on. We need to build capacities. The parent might know how to do that, but they don't have, as you heard, the slack. They don't have the slack in their life because they're working that second job because they aren't being paid a living wage. So how do we help them build that capacity in their life to do so? We need to make sure we do things in homes and communities. The healthcare world is terrible about this. We want everyone to come into the clinic or the hospital. Well, it's not very useful and it's not necessarily very feasible. What can we do that's actually in the environments that they are in? We want to certainly address root causes, have the long-term effects that, that we really need to look for. We want to address prevention wherever, wherever possible. And we want to use those first thousand days of life. That's not to say, as you've heard, that there aren't opportunities later on or that you give up later on but there's so much potential in those first thousand days that we can utilize. We want to use evidence guided. Not everything needs to be evidence based because the evidence doesn't exist in many of those cases. And if we, in, in the practice of pediatric medicine, if we only did things that were evidence based, we'd just close up and go home because there's actually not studies for many things because it's really hard to do those studies on kids. And then of course, we need things we can take to scale. It's really hard as we have some great programs out there with great results that are not necessarily as scalable as we'd like. So um, in the clinical practice world, what are the sort of recommendations we have out there? So every speaker has to have one slide that's unreadable at a distance. That is, this is that slide. <laughs> um, but let me, let me blow up for you the top part because that's really what's important. What are we asking people to do during those regular checkups? We're asking them to think about how can they explore the child's environment? What can they assess during that, that well-child visit? How do we strengthen that parent-child bond or attachment with every question we ask or every piece of advice we give? What can we do to teach parents about development? And then how can we support parents as they nurture their child's development? And keeping those things in mind and not just a little check off, you know, I, I call it Mad Libs medicine when you're just filling in the template on, you know, now the computer screen. I tell my students and residents, please don't do that because all you're doing is filling in a bunch of blanks. Find out what the family needs, find out what their questions are, and explore all these different things. I don't care really if they're taking a multivitamin or not. It's, it, it rarely matters in most cases. Don't use your valuable time on those sorts of things. Um, so at the AP, we have this uh, our EBCD, Early Brain Child Development page. Um, and there's a number of things on there. There's modules. You can download these for free. I wrote them. I'm very proud of them um, <laughs> with a lot of help. And uh, you can download these so if people can learn about things like toxic stress. They can learn about things like adverse childhood experiences. They can learn about different types of programs that exist out there um, and so on. We also have a variety of resources, different pages, often from other organizations. We're not claiming that we're the only folks out there doing it. There's folks that are actually doing a lot more work than we are. But we're trying to connect folks in the healthcare world to that. And then, of course, links to other different things that are, that are out there. There's other programs and projects out there, different types of training, positive parenting, parent-child home, play and learn, so on. You know, I won't go into those, but those are important parts of the equation and we wanna make sure that folks in healthcare know that these exist. I send my residents, I run the community pediatrics and advocacy rotation for them. I make them go to some of these programs so that they understand what they are and what they do. And we also wanna emphasize poverty aware approaches to care whenever possible throughout the healthcare system, particularly hospital admissions and things like that. 
in the community, really, any sort of community-based mentoring activity and so on, again, we need to view this not just as a nice place for kids to be, but an important part of that social structure network and those important buffering uh, aspects. Outside the clinical realm, there's all sorts of other things, early intervention, working with judicial uh, systems, foster care, et cetera. And then because, of course, when it comes to treatment, it's difficult, it's hard to find, and it can be expensive. So um, a few points, though. At 18 months, we can measure the disparities in vocabulary. If you look at these three different socioeconomic groups, you can see that there is a big difference um, already by 18 months, which is the first circle that's appearing up there those kids are already, we're measuring a difference in their receptive vocabulary. And by 24 months, we see that the middle class kids are pulling away from those living in poverty. So big difference in language there. This comes down to this 30 million word gap that I know so many, that all of you have probably heard. We know it's not just the words, it's, all, it's a nice proxy for all the other things that go on around in terms of interactions, but that's really what's going on. So why do I emphasize reading when I work with families and parents? Because reading is the fundamental skill for learning. We live in a text-heavy society. Even if you look around this room, you can see how many examples of text are around us that we're using to be basically pull information together. So when a child is aware of books, okay, not necessarily reading, but aware of books, there's a few things that come along with that. One is this notion of print awareness, that print actually conveys information. The two-year-old, even who's been read to, doesn't recognize that those funny little marks at the bottom of the page actually represent meaning. They think it's a decoration. But the three-year-old starts to understand, wait, there's something going on, and starts to make that connection. They start to develop background knowledge and strategies so they can obtain meaning from print. That unusual word that they don't know, they can start trying to fill it in and come up with a working definition on the fly, which is very useful throughout, you know, throughout your life. And then the more they look at text, they become a fluent reader. They're able to look at things quickly and easily. So with some parents, we recognize that they think that to read to their child is to read at their child. Sit your 15-month-old down and read at them. And that works really well because the 15-month-old has a attention span of half a second, right? So instead, what we want to do is encourage this concept of dialogic reading, this back and forth, look at the pictures, help them find, turn it into a back and forth. And that's something we can model because reading to children, to young children, may not be a natural skill for adults. The parent themselves, of course, may have their own literacy issues, and that is one of the things they will often not reveal out there, and it may be a multi-generational problem. But if reading works, it's what we call a triumph of the early brain overall. So Reach Out and Read is a program that works in primary care clinics to make reading and advice about reading of everyday part of the regular well-child visit that's out there. It's really, in a sense, a school readiness program, but it's also a two-generation approach that works to build parenting capacity and capabilities as well. We encourage families to lead aloud with, or read aloud with their young children at every well child visit, actually now ideally starting from birth. That's really the heart of the program. They're hearing it from us. They're hearing it from their health care provider. And if I had to summarize the whole program in a single slide, in a single picture, it would be this, the prescription to read. I actually used to hand these out in clinic. Now they print on my after visit summaries there in the electronic world. Um, I've handed these out when I do advocacy. This is the most important prescription I will ever hand a family. And I really mean that. And I will say this, that because the, the other thing we do is we walk into the visit with the book in our hand. And I hand this book directly to the child to watch what they do with it. I watch what the parent's reaction is. I watch to see, does the child turn it around and hold it up in that universal read to me gesture? When they do that, that child has told me a lot about their relationship with their parent about what they do at home, all those sorts of things together. I miss that if I just have someone else hand it out. I said this in a federal congressional briefing on Reach and Read once, and I'll say it again here. In a well-child visit where there's no other identified complaint, I would rather walk in without my stethoscope than without a book, because I'm going to learn much more from watching what happens with this book. And then, of course, we do literacy-rich waiting rooms wherever possible to really encourage them. Why? Because young kids are being seen by healthcare providers early in life. I know that was mentioned yesterday. That's really where, where one of those points of access that most kids are being, uh, that are contacting at some point. We do have evidence. We have 15 studies pub published in peer-reviewed journals um, that show that at-risk kids are more likely to be read to, improve language scores, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also in the Bright Futures Guide for um, uh, how to do well child care over time. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, read to your kids, put them to, put them to bed at the same time is basically what those slides say. <laughs> I'll skip my video, which is available on YouTube, which is a great example of how much you can learn in just three minutes from a family. 
um, and what they, uh, about their family life and their interaction and all sorts of things, language development, et cetera. Fast way for me to do my job of, of uh, developmental surveillance in so many ways. Um, and there's a lot of us. So reach out and read is kind of like that elephant in the blind men are feeling, um, feeling the elephant, feeling different things. Some people see the book giveaway part of it. Some people say, oh, it's an educational intervention. Uh-huh, it's that too. It's also a way to do developmental surveillance. It's a way to build those parental capacities that, that we want them to have. It's a way to buffer toxic stress, that moment that a kid can be next to their, their parent and uh, in their, their busy lives. It's a way to assess the relationship of that family. It's a public health approach, and it's a scalable evidence-based model. It's, of course, not any one of these things that when it comes down to it, it is all of these things really coming together um, all at once. Um, so um, I'm just going to skip to my last slide here. There's some falling kids with nets. Uh, this is one of those metaphors that's always out there about public health and so on. Um, but I just want to make sure I do throw my closing quote at you. Sorry, I don't have the computer right in front of me, so I can't zip, zip forward as quickly as I usually would. Um, Senate Joint Resolution 59 in Wisconsin about the early brain. Yay, we're winning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers. All too often, preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever-increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children, so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. Because this is what I see in too many of my patients. I see too many kids who we will never see their talents. We will never see those things out there, and we want to be part of helping that. This is my wife reading to my son, and it just caught them in a lovely moment of being lost in the book together. And it reminds me of the quote that children are made readers in the laps of their parents. Those are my, my email and my social media links. And with that, I will turn it back over. Fantastic. All right. So we are <laughs> we're sure on time. So let's get some questions flowing. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Marcella Wilson, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, thank you. Wonderful presentation. I'm wondering if you have any feedback on food insecurity mm -hmm. and the relationship to brain development and what we can, is there anything to do to overcome the changes in that brain development? So, I mean, I think any type of scarcity, but food, food is one of those basics. And I think it also, shelter, you know, the, the, I, I uh, volunteer at a shelter clinic and see a lot of homeless children, unfortunately. Um, I think any sense of scarcity uh, really creates these changes that you see. You see this constant toxic stress. You also see that the kids don't develop the kinds of skills to get themselves out of these situations because it's not being modeled for them. And you get this cycle of dependency that seems to occur. What we do know that some of the epigenetic changes that Sarah mentioned that, you know, we, we focus on the environmental stressors, but one of them is also nutritional status. Yes. You know, so we know that one of the switches on whether genes are getting turned on and off is also the presence or absence of good nutrition. So what I've read is, is that food insecurity can cause developmental changes or lack of development, white matter, gray matter, hippocampus, and amygdala. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, because we're dealing with that every day in Detroit, how do we, is there a pathway to compensate for that after the damage has already been done? You know, I mean, I th that's a complicated question. I think, I mean, I think it depends a little bit. Has the food insecurity resolved? So, so can you can you meet the child's nutritional needs now, or is this an ongoing issue? So that's kind of one one piece of it. Um, certainly, you know, you need good nutrition, and you need a certain a, a pretty high percentage of high quality fats to build a brain. I mean, that's just what it takes. Um, and you certainly see that actually starting in the prenatal period and, and continuing. Um, and you see very large differences in brain volume um, for kids who have not had, not had those nutritional resources. Now, the hippocampus and the amygdala, that's telling you that their brain has, has adapted, has made choices about that situation. Does it still make sense to do the kinds of things that we're talking about? Absolutely, Absolutely right? And I think, I honestly think that's probably the, uh, Meeting the basic needs, I think, is key, right? But then the other piece of that, of what to do to kind of get out from that situation, is going to be giving them that emotional safety and security and, and the kinds of inputs they need 
for a long, long time, right? I mean, just think about what happens if you get um, is scared or traumatized about something. How long does it take before in that situation you don't respond or you have zero reaction? It takes a lot of times of nothing happening, nothing bad happening, right? And then maybe one day you're on that dark road, you know, and it's been 10 years and you still think, ooh, you know, that's good. It's keeping you safe, right? So, so trying, to, trying to get, you know, 100 good experiences for every bad experience trying to just really flood them with that kind of supportive nurturing environment and lots of things to build a brain with that are positive. But it's hard for me to answer your question if the, if the child is still in a resource restriction right. stage, I think, then, then that's... So the, ba the brain, given the right circumstances, can recover later in the developmental stage. That's the core of my question. Given everything's good, we address the food insecurity, we provide all these responses, talking about, can the brain recover? That's the we have very little evidence on that. Most of the evidence for that is when you're talking about like children who were institutionalized and adopted. And if you look at that literature, if it's after two that, that they're put into the, the new environment, um, you do still see some residual differences. Now, they can become fairly minor, and they can become things that um, you might not even detect, like balance issues, for example, because the cerebellum takes a big, takes a big hit. Um, a lot of risk for ADHD and other kinds of, um, but those are going to be pretty, uh, you know, they're going to co-occur with the emotional pieces. So I think if it's before age two, you know, less after age two, more, more, more services, and that's going to continue. So uh, I think we've got to wrap it up. Um, but if, if I can just uh, encourage us all to remember that the brain is, in fact, very plastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we should all walk out of the room feeling very hopeful about that extended plasticity. Um, so not only is it uh, never too early to do the best possible thing, but it's never too late um, to do something. Right. Exactly. All right. So uh, that's time, I guess. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That that is time, but.